Hello. Today we will be discussing wind energy systems. My name is Ryan Sheffield and my colleagues are Vanessa Nunez, Steven Valencia, and Kevin Alvarez. On the screen we have the agenda we will be discussing today. Wind energy systems have been used back as far as, as, far back as 5000 BC, though then they were used as a, in a manner that is a little non-traditional to what we are used to saying today. So back in 5000 BC, wind energy systems were used in sails for moving boats and this is in fact still defined as wind energy systems. A more traditional way of using wind energy systems in more in the form of wind turbines has been used as early as the first century AD. And now in these systems it was used more in terms of uh, translating mechanical energy into mechanical energy, into rotational or linear, linear kinetic to move a saw or to grind some mills. And um, as early as 1854, Mr. Daniel Halliday actually patented a, a windmill, as you can see on here, that is more intact with what we are familiar with today, transferring this wind energy into electrical. And something notable about Mr. Daniel Halliday's design is that this one was, um, did not require the interaction of the human. So this one can, in fact, rotate, self-rotate towards the direction of the wind. And it can also change the pitch of the turbines so that during turbulent weather it would not damage it from rotating too fast. Wind turbines are very complex systems. Um, it's not just a generator, it's not just a turbine, it's, it's a whole system of these components. And so um, there's various standards, uh, an extensive list in which it would be applicable. Uh, so here are just some of the different topics that are applicable as you can see on screen. Now for environmental impact and sustainability, um, there are several components I'd like to discuss today, just highlighting some of the main ones. Those are noise, uh, visual appearance, effects on wildlife, and electromagnetic interference. Perhaps the most uh, dominant one here is the noise. Um, there are several complaints when you're putting in too close to a population. So there are regulations in certain countries, as you can see on this table here. They usually float around 30 to 40 decibels um, limits. Uh, visual appearance, um, that's pretty self-explanatory. Some people just don't like the way they look. And uh, effects on wildlife, of course we want to minimize that. We're putting a structure perhaps in the way of birds, or we don't want to um, destroy wildlife uh, habits for that. And electromagnetic interference, that depends on the materials that you use, but if certain materials are used, they could in fact uh, cause electromagnetic interference. In terms of economic impact, um, this was a study done in north central Nebraska and this is based on 400 uh, megawatts of turbines. Now on the right side over here in this figure we can see several uh, numbers that would uh, be applicable to this. Some of the more notable ones is that we have during operation of these 173 to 266 turbines, we have an effect of $113 million uh, over the course of 20 years. Project formulation. So how does a wind turbine work? Uh, wind turbine works by harvesting the uh, kinetic energy in the uh, surroundings and converting to rotational energy. This energy ca can be stored in for future uses. So here we have the kinetic energy we previously mentioned. And um, uh, we have to mention that this uh, equation uh, relates to mass and the flux, which is uh, directly uh, related to the area of the uh, blades. This is very important for the generation of power. Design specifications and conditions. Um, geographic conditions, uh, the wind generation is uh, based on uh, lower circulations, um, such as jet streams, trade winds, and polar jets. Um, also, fluid properties are, are in the equation, such as volume, velocity, density, and flux. Um, this is the um, this is one of the current prototypes. This is Hitachi's uh, prototype, which is able to develop about about 2,000 kilowatts of um, energy. Uh, this is considered a state of the art uh, in wind turbines. Uh, addressing global designs. So, uh, current prototypes uh, use fiberglass. Um, and this material is very expensive. Um, this, uh, not only it, it's very expensive, but it, it adds uh, a lot of weight to the structure, and it requires uh, a very specific uh, materials and tools. So, uh, addressing global design. So, the answer for this problem is the use of architectural fabric that wraps around a uh, metal, and um, this will have the shape of a fish bone. Uh, this uh, new uh, prototype will include different parts of the world that cannot afford uh, fiberglass, which is expensive. 
Um, according to the Virginia Polytechnic Institute, uh, this new design will, dec uh, will uh, decrement the price of per unit as much as 20 to 40 percent in considerations. Um, these towers are expensive. They can cost up to uh, $2 million, and if we put this in perspective, with $2 million right now, we can power about 20, 21,000 cars. Wind location is, um, is another uh, constraint right now for these towers because uh, usually they are um, put on, in remote locations. Um, and so the transmission lines, can, they have to be stretched out for uh, best terrains, and this is costly. They also cause n noise and aesthetic pollu uh, pollution. Um, as we know, these uh, towers are very big, and they cause uh, a visual impact on the environment. environment. The most common uh, wind turbine energy recovery system that we have today is the horizontal axis uh, wind turbine. As you can see here, this is a three-bladed design. Uh, these are the ones that are mostly used for commercial use. Uh, they have different blade configurations. The most common one is the three-bladed one, but there's also two-bladed as well as one-bladed one that has been tested before. When you have multi-bladed, that's usually used for smaller uh, domestic or residential use. Um, what you have to take into account is that the higher you go, the more wind that you're gonna have and higher speeds. So these towers are usually hundreds of meters in, in length and in order for them to uh, get all the energy from the wind they actually have to use a yaw motor to turn the actual turbine into the wind. Um, they're highly efficient, the horizontal axis wind turbines. They, they are, can also be placed in offshore uh, places. Um, the Vestas V164 is actually the largest capacity uh, wind turbine that we have today. It produces about 8 million watts, um, but they do require large foundations as well as have high initial cost. And as stated before, they do have a tendency to be on the little bit loud sale. Um, another design that is currently being used is the vertical axis wind turbines. Um, there's not many of these in commercial use, but a lot more in residential use. They're, the shaft that actually rotates the generator sits transverse to the wind and it's omnidirectional, so it doesn't need to be pointed into any direction. They have a lower production cost, but they do have a tendency to vibrate. So this high vibration also causes them to have high maintenance costs. Um, they're less efficient than our, our horizontal axis wind turbines and uh, they're also prone to fatigue. Um, when you have large scale commercial ones, you need guide wires to hold down these blades and that can also increase the real estate of what you're trying to do. For future designs, uh, you have something that's like this, which is a flip wing. You also have cross wing kites and you have some that are assisted with balloons. So these all take into account uh, or take away the, the towers from the design, but then they have a tether, which is a large cable, kind of like what they use for weather balloons. And these tethers can actually cause a, a, a hazard for low flying airplanes or anything like that that's trying to pass through the system. Uh, the technology is still in its infancy, but it is, um, it is improving at, uh, basically on a monthly basis. Uh, companies that are owned by Google are researching this technology and, and so on. Alright, so the first step in the assembly is the nacelle, which will hold the, bla the blades and house the gear, the gear box. The turbine base is then attached to the shipping frame, and in the shipping frame, the jaw system is attached to the main frame. Both of these will then be attached to the turbine base. The, the gearbox and generator will then be mounted on the main frames, and the generator is what will convert the wind's kinetic energy into the electrical energy that will be used in the grid. After assembly, the wiring will be done, and then the turbine will be tested in a dynam dynamometer, um, which will be tested over 151 points, and after that testing is passed, it will be then uh, sent for shipping and assembly. Then the cell bus and will, will hold a lightning protector in case that the turbine will be struck by lightning. After all these protectors and uh, turbine base covers are placed, it will be sent for a last um, inspection, which will be 600, over 670 points, 
After all those points are inspected, it is then put into shipping for the assembly at the final. Some of the manufacturability constraints that holds today are the cost of wind turbines, which can range from 1.5 to 2 million dollars per wind turbine, as well as, as well as the infrastructure that we have in place today to be able to transport the parts of the wind turbine from one place to the other. Um, other designs are being um, studied to be able to overcome these constraints. Um, not only by cost, but also by the design to make it more feasible to transport from one place so to So as our need for renewable energy increases, so does the need for manufacturability of the wind turbine. Many options are being put in place to be able to innovate current designs as well as produce new designs that are more cost effective as well as more efficient in terms of the amount of energy that's produced. Definitely one of the major constraints that wind turbines face today is the cost as well as the portability or being able to install it in different So the idea of harvesting power from the wind is definitely not one that's new. It's been used for thousands of years, but it's definitely an idea that will help us move away from the use of fossil fuels, help lower the impact of fossil fuels into the global warming, and be able to use alternative energy and be able to move forward within the technology.